Good morning. It's so good to see you. I, uh, last Sunday, I was actually speaking at the refugee church that we've been praying with and for and hoping to be able to partner with, helping them find a place of their own to worship. And we had a great time together. And uh, if you don't know, we're in a series on the Holy Spirit. And we started the series by just acknowledging the Holy Spirit is the way that God is present with us today. How is God present with us? And it's through His Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. And uh, last Sunday, didn't Amy do a great job? Yeah, she did. She talked about how the Holy Spirit, one of His first gifts to us is to help us understand who God is and to connect with Him. And so we want to continue that. We're, our overall theme right now is, is about uh, thriving. And of course, our assumption always is, I will thrive if my conditions and my circumstances are the best. I will thrive if my, my conditions and my circumstances are the best. So when they're not the best, we get frustrated and we wonder if we're failing in some way. And we think that we can't move ahead. But what we're learning is, is that we actually thrive, not when our circumstances are perfect, but our connection with God is good. And so we talked about the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is important to us because it helps us navigate life, not only when things are good, but when they're not so good. We need wisdom for those moments. And then we talked about emotional and spiritual health, that some of us tend to gravitate to one of those things or the other. Some of us will go in on emotional health, but kind of avoid spirituality. Some of us will go in on spirituality, but avoid the emotional health. And what God wants us to know is that we thrive when both of those things are health healthy. And then we talked uh, for a few weeks about freedom, that when we learn to embrace freedom and walk in freedom, that's when we tend to thrive. And now we're in this spirit, uh, uh, series on the Holy Spirit because when we partner with the Spirit, we tend to thrive. And so uh, I'm, I'm in John chapter 7 this morning and beginning in verse 37, and this is what the, uh, uh, Jesus said, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said with a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is a prophet. Others said, he is the Messiah. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus people were divided because of Jesus. Think about that. People were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. I have a theory, and uh, I'd like to uh, suggest that this might be worth our considering today, and the theory is this. The Holy Spirit works through you to help others. The Holy Spirit works through you to help others. When you look at things that the Holy Spirit did in the New Testament. And what you begin to discover is that there were things that happened, but the thing that happened was to set up something else that needed to happen with other people. For example, on the day of Pentecost, there was 120 people, they were gathered together, they were praying, they were seeking God, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they actually began to speak languages they had not learned. And some people would say, well, that's, that's it, that's, that's all that there is. But the reason the Holy Spirit helped them speak languages that they had not learned was because they declared the wonderful things of God to people who spoke different languages. They could hear it in their own language, how good God was. Or Peter's vision. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but Peter was, had this vision, uh, a mental image, and it helped change his paradigm about something that would open up the door to serving people he would ordinarily avoid. Even Paul's conversion, when you look at his conversion, it seems very supernatural, but the reason that, that he had such a supernatural conversion is so that he could go into all the world and preach the gospel. God uses his Holy Spirit 
and he uses the Holy Spirit through us to help others. Listen to what it says. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within. Did you see the direction of that? Rivers of living water will flow from within because the Holy Spirit works through you to help others. I think a lot of us would prefer that the direction be changed and the rivers would flow into us from the Holy Spirit. And I think that what we assume that would do for us is, is we would have certain experiences and those experiences would change our lives completely. And I wish, I wish that an experience changed people's life. But it doesn't always. The nation of Israel, when they were in bondage in Egypt for, for hundreds of years, when they finally came out, the number of miracles God did on their behalf was unbelievable. There were 10 plagues, all supernatural. And then even after they got out, God brought them through the Red Sea. God fed, gave them water out of a rock. God gave them manna. If you want to know what manna is, the word just means, what is it? It came down from heaven every single day. It was laying on the ground. They picked it up. They could eat it. But what is it? That's what, that's what they called it. They, they never could figure out what it was, but it was good. Um, though they did get bored with it. Um, we would like the rivers to flow in towards us. All of those individuals, all of those individuals experienced all of those things, but only two of them made it into the promised land because their, their system was backwards. They believed that the Holy Spirit was just to flow into them as opposed to flowing from them to help others. That when all we want is just the Holy Spirit to flow in, we, we wind up becoming stagnant. Now, this is very important because what it means is, is that we're going to have to connect with some people. If the Holy Spirit is to flow from us to help others, we're going to have to make some connections with people. And, and uh, some of us would prefer that that didn't happen. Um, we're created in the image of God, and what we know is God exists in, in three persons, three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What we know is they have been in an eternal community forever. Some people think that when God created man, the reason he created man is because he was lonely. He was just all by himself, but that's not true. It was more like this. It was that what we have together is so good, we should, bring, we should create some more people and bring it in. Let them participate in this too. It was, it was more like that. The truth is, is that we were created in God's image and we're made for community. But the truth also is we are not great at community. The very thing we want is the thing we tend to mess up. And so we find ourselves in smaller and smaller circles until sometimes we're isolated, we're alone, and no one thrives in isolation. No one becomes mature in isolation. No one becomes uh, well-equipped in isolation. So we tend to move towards health and maturity when we're connected with other people because there are people who can challenge us, there are people who can encourage us, there are people who can support us, there are people who can pray for us. This is all a really big deal. So part of the Holy Spirit's work, this is really important part of the Holy Spirit's work is not just to help us believe but to help us belong to connect with others and belong first John the first chapter says this we proclaim to you that what we have seen and heard so that you may have what does he want them to have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship. Some people think fellowship is eating a donut or a bagel and drinking a cup of coffee. <laughs> oh yeah, I had fellowship today. I had two donuts. I had double fellowship. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, in fact, I can, I can show you that that's not what it means, just obvious. In the, in the second chapter of Acts, it says that the, the church had fellowship and they broke bread 
uh, from house to house, which it's not the same thing. Otherwise, it would just be, be redundant, right? They, they broke bread and they broke bread. They have fellowship and they have fellowship. There's something distinct and unique about it. And, and fellowship, actually, the Greek word is, is koinonia. Anybody want to try to speak a little Greek this morning? Let's all say it together. Koinonia. Yeah. So, um, and th that Greek word uh, means what is shared. What is shared. The idea of fellowship is, is what is shared. And what is shared shows up in in multiple ways. For example, let's say this morning that uh, when we're done with this service, we need to have all the chairs stacked and in the back because there's something going on in this space. And we might ask people to help stay and stack those chairs and, and, and get them out of the way. And there would be people who would stay and they would help. They would share in the work. They would participate. See, and, and part of koinonia is not just that I came and had a donut and I came and listened to PB talk today. Part is that we all have something that we can do to share with someone else, to help them, to encourage them, to support them. Uh, the idea of sharing is also this idea of intimacy. There's a close connection that when you're doing something with someone, you, you get closer to them. You, you share in the mission, so you actually share in the life of that person. And then there's contribution. You share what you have to help someone else. That's the concept behind fellowship. We cannot declare we want to follow Jesus and then avoid others. Jesus always leads us to others. And some of us struggle with this. I would ask how many people are introverts in the room, but you won't raise your hand <laughs> because you're introverted. And I would ask how many people are extroverted in the room, but you might not stop with raising your hand. The Holy Spirit comes to connect us to God and others. If our whole concept is the Holy Spirit only connects us to God and I go deeper in him and, and I, I experience more of him, all of that is true, but that's only part of what the Holy Spirit does. He comes to connect us to God and others. The Holy Spirit helps us. How do we do this? The Holy Spirit helps us walk in the light as opposed to in the shadows. Now, what does it mean to walk in the shadows? What does it mean to kind of stay out of the light? And the, the primary way that we stay out of the light is by pretending, pretending. We pretend to be something that we're not. We pretend to have something we don't have. We pretend we can do something that we can't do. We pretend that we love more than we actually love. We pretend that we're honest when we're not completely honest. That we, we can have, we pretend we're more caring than we actually are. And the fact, this is interesting, the fact that we're pretending would indicate that we think that's a value because you don't pretend to be something that you think has no value. So that makes sense, right? We, we want that, we desire that, but somehow we feel we're just pretending to do that. And where the pretending shows up the most is when we, when we struggle and we fail. There's a great story in the Old Testament. I wish I had time to describe and explain it, but there were two brothers and, and they were twins. And, and one brother was favored by the father, the other brother, not so much. And, and the younger brother really wanted to have his father's blessing. He wanted to hear the words from his father that, that he'd never heard in his life. And so his father was very old and his father was blind. And so this man, his name was Jacob, he went and pretended to be his brother. His brother had very hairy arms. So he put on sheep's, sheepskin on his, on, his, on his arms. so that if, And then he put on his brother's clothes so that he would smell like his brother, all to hear his father say what he wanted to hear him say. And, and, he, and it worked. I mean, his father was a little confused, but, but he was really old. And he thought, well, I'm just a little confused. And so he, he issues the words of blessing. And you would think that in that moment, Jacob would go, finally, I hear the words I want. The problem is, is when you know you're pretending and then you hear those words, you don't think they belong to you. How many of us have pretended to be something that we're not to hear somebody say what we always wanted to hear from them. And then when they say it, it doesn't mean what we thought it would. No. So this idea of pretending first John, it says this first chapter. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light and him is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, 
We lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. We just can't experience fellowship if we pretend. Which means the Holy Spirit actually has to help us to be open and vulnerable. And this terrifies us. We're not comfortable with this. But this really is the pathway to fellowship. I cannot get close to others by pretending. I'm going to have to learn to come out of the shadows. Um, there, are, there are support groups for people that struggle with things like uh, alcohol and, and narcotics and uh, AA and NA, I'm sure you've heard of them. And one of the things that's true when those people get together in a support group is they insist on radical honesty. Like if they failed this week, they, they're going to say, I dropped the ball this week, I, I failed. Or if their addiction somehow brought harm or pain to other people's lives, they don't pretend, they don't deny, they just say, you know what, my actions caused that person pain. I want to own that. And this is what's absolutely fascinating. You would think that in that environment, people would start separating themselves from each other, but they don't. They actually draw closer together and they actually start getting better. Why? Because they're starting to walk in the light. They're refusing to hide out in the shadows. Covering our sin doesn't cleanse us from our sin. Confessing it does. Confessing it does. Coming out of the shadows, out of the darkness, into the light. And this is what we think Christianity is. I will stay over here in the shadow until I have my act together, and then I will come out in the light. And then if I screw it up somehow, I will say something like, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. It's kind of like that. But when we live like that, we don't build bridges of fellowship, we build barriers. And we cannot thrive when we're isolated. Uh, isolation. Uh, when our parents wanted to discipline us, what would they do? They would... Uh, let's try. What would they do? I'm hearing a couple of things. One is spanking and the other is time out. And so if you were raised Baptist or Assembly of God, you got spankings. If you were raised Methodist or Presbyterian, uh, you got uh, timeouts. And if you were raised Episcopalian, they just took a little bit money out of your trust fund. That's how. <laughs> um, we, we just, in, if you're in a prison, like if you step out of bounds in prison, one of the punishments that they have is considered really, really difficult is they put you in, in solitary confinement to be isolated. Uh, First John 4 says this, there is no fear in love. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. The Holy Spirit helps us step out into the light. When we are afraid, when we don't want to be seen for what's actually happening in our life, we tend to withdraw. Some people do that. Some people tend to attack. There's a lot of attacking going on in our world. And what I can tell you is anger is a secondary emotion. Most of the anger that we see in our world right now comes from fear. It comes from fear. People are very afraid on a lot of things. Some people are afraid of everything. And, uh, and so what, what feels more spiritual to you? Withdrawing or attacking? And of course the answer is withdrawing. But the problem is it still isolates us and it still feels like punishment. We have to learn to walk in the light. Where there's no sharing of life, there's no life. Life is, is what we share. When we take off our mask of better, that's when we actually start getting better. Just honest. See, I need other people in my life to, to encourage me because I don't always feel like going on. I need other people in my life to support me because I don't always have the strength that I need. I need other people in my life to challenge me because I will tend towards an easier path if given the option. 
No, some people are afraid that if, if I start pursuing spirituality like this, I'm going to wind up in a small group and they're going to make me pray out loud. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. Or, or they might read a passage of scripture and ask me what I think about it. And, and do you know what most people do? This is it's so sad because it happens all the time. A lot of people in a small group setting like that will pray the prayer, not of what they actually think, but they'll pray the prayer they think other people want to hear. You know, what they're thinking is, oh God, this is a dumpster fire. I don't know how I'm going to survive this. But what's their prayer? Oh Father, thank you today for bringing us amongst these people filled with joy and happiness. Or are you... You read a passage of scripture and you, and you have a, a really serious thought about it. And it's, you know, how, how could God do a thing like that? And is that what you say? Oh, oh no. What do you say? Well, I'm sure what it, what, God had a good reason. I don't know. He had a good reason. I wonder how much better our small groups would be if we prayed the prayers we wanted to pray and shared the thoughts we actually thought. Do you know what that would require? coming out of the shadows. So, well, what if I say something that's anti-biblical? I, I, I'm just going to help you with this, just in case you're involved in a small group or are, are going to be, which you're going to hear about later. But small group, okay. So, if somebody, if somebody says something really heretical, don't respond with, you can't say that. That's not actually helpful. Okay? Respond with the truth that helps them understand that that idea is, is not strong, it's not valid. Well, actually, Scripture reveals God to be this. So how can that help us understand this? That would, that would be useful. And, and some people are afraid of becoming legalistic. So some of you have, have run across people like that. Some of you have been people like that. And uh, it doesn't help. This is a church, not a theater. We don't come here to play a part or to play a role. We come here to be part of the fellowship of God's people and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to see what he can do with our lives while we are together. Yeah? We're not here to put anybody down. We're here to lift Jesus up and to lift other people up. Yeah. The Holy Spirit gives us the courage to be honest with others because we cannot grow without others. I'm going to have the worship team come out. I'm going to end with this story uh, today. I, I told you I would refer to it. It's the story of Peter's vision. You can find it in Acts chapter 10. And uh, Peter, uh, it's, it's lunchtime. And he's up at the, the roofs in that part of the country at that time. Most of them were flat. And, and he went up on the roof because that's where the breeze was. And, and he's, someone else is preparing lunch. And so he's hungry. And while he's waiting, he just thought he'd pray. He'd have a conversation with God. While he's having a conversation with God, an interesting thing, is that Scripture says he fell into a trance. Doesn't that sound terrifying? Like how many don't want to fall in a trance while you're driving? That's not nearly enough of you. Just, <laughs> uh, well, the, the word trance is it's really interesting because the, in other places in the New Testament, it's, it's uh, translated as amazing or astonishing. He starts, he's still aware of what's around him, but He's focused on something that's capturing his imagination, his attention. And he sees a mental image. And the mental image is of a giant sheet that's being let down from heaven. And, and there's a bunch of animals inside the sheet. And, he, and there's a voice that says, Peter, get up, kill, eat. And Peter says, uh, no, God, uh, I don't ever eat anything that's not clean. With all the stuff that Peter has done in his life, you think that he would not be bragging about his dietary <laughs> habits, right? But no, he's, that's where he's going. And, uh, and he says, no, and, and so God says it again. Get up, kill, eat. No, get up, kill, eat. And uh, every time Peter says, no, I've, I've never eaten anything that's unclean. 
And every time God responds to him, do not call something unclean when I've cleansed it. And so Peter's sitting there and like this, this mental image is gone and he's just, he's perplexed. What does this mean? And while he's thinking through these thoughts and the food hasn't come yet, there's a knock at the gate of the house. And, and he has this thought, this prompting, this internal direction. And, and the internal direction basically goes like this. Get up. Oh, I love that it started with the same words. Get up. Go downstairs. There's some people that have come to see you. Go with them and don't worry about anything. These were thoughts that kind of broke into Peter's mind. And what we discover is, is that that was actually a work of the Holy Spirit. That Peter does go with them. And of all places, the person who asked him to come was a Roman officer. Like Israel's under the occupation of a foreign power, Rome. And a Roman officer, of which we know these things about, it said that he, was, he had a lot of respect for God, he was very generous with poor people, and he would pray. And God had given him a mental image, a vision, about Peter to go find him and bring him, and he would have words of life. And so Peter goes to his house, and he's gathered all of his friends and all of his family, and Peter preaches the gospel. And all of them become believers, and all of them are baptized in water, and all of them are filled with the Spirit. Isn't that absolutely amazing? Amazing. But it all started with this, this kind of mental image. Don't stop calling things unclean that I'm cleaning. Go with them. Don't worry. See, our mind is constantly running a thought pattern all the time. We're thinking all the time. Like right now, you're thinking, we're thinking all the time. What am I thinking about? I'm thinking, is this message going to end anytime soon? I'm, I'm thinking... <laughs> Should I go on my phone and, and order ahead of schedule so I can just pick it up for, for lunch today? I wonder what the weather's going to be. I wonder if the rain's going to hold up. I was, I, oh, look at that, my hands. They look like my parents' hands. It's just, what a terrifying thing. I'll hold my hands behind my back. And it's just, our, our brain is always right. It's, it's why we're so attracted to these things is because when we're focused on these, we don't think our own thoughts. And we're very uncomfortable with our own thoughts. So well, how can you tell if a thought is a, of the Holy Spirit or if it's, if it's of uh, just myself? That, that's a fair question. And uh, it might be easier than you think. If your thought is, I need to avoid those people, probably you. I need to give those people a piece of my mind, probably you. I should see if I can help someone in some way, probably the Holy Spirit. Maybe you just have a prompting. I just want to pray a prayer of blessing on you today, a prayer of encouragement. Is there something I can do to support you? All those ideas, where do you think they come from? Do you really think you're that noble, that generous, and that good to be thinking that kind of thing all the time? We're not, but the Holy Spirit comes to help us. The Holy Spirit flows through us to help others. I'd like you to bow your head right now. And I know your mind is gonna be doing a lot of things, but here's a really important thing to know is that you can actually, you might not choose the thoughts that come to your mind, but you can choose the thoughts you focus on. And I'm wondering if you're willing to pray the very boldest of prayers today, and that is, Holy Spirit, will you give me thoughts that would help others and then give me the courage to act on them? In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll stand to our feet this morning.